Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Fullest Podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Bostwick, and today's guest is Brian Carr, who's a second generation indoor environmental consultant specializing in working with hypersensitive individuals with complex medical conditions. He keeps them, he helps them understand if mold, mycotoxins, or other indoor pathogens exist in their homes that may be contributing to their health conditions and how to remedy those issues. Brian has become a go-to mold and biotoxin resource for many medical practitioners across the country and has helped over 3,000 hypersensitive individuals nationwide to create healthier living environments that have allowed their doctors to help them get better. Brian is a co-founder of We Inspect, a national indoor environmental assessment company specializing in mold and biotoxin detection and management for hypersensitive individuals. He's also the creator of Mold Finders Method, a digital DIY inspection program developed for hypersensitive individuals. The Mold Finders Method program teaches its users how to identify and remove mold and mycotoxins from their homes so they can get healthy again. Hi, Brian. Hey, that is so long. I need to, yeah. I need to figure that out. <laughs> Honestly, I don't typically read everyone's full bio, but I think everything in there is really important for everyone to get. So um, in this situation I did and I, yeah, I just, um, I'm so happy to have you on today. I have been wanting to have this conversation for a while. I found you, I think through Dr. Jess. Oh, cool. And I love her work. We've worked with her. We've had her on the podcast. We work together on some content and um, for the website for people to have access to when it comes to mold and other things. But yeah, I just, you know, I, there's so many questions I have and I have a history of having um, issues with mold in one of my rental properties when I was in um, freshly out of college. And, you know, I'm like reading through some of this stuff. Like I've, I have EBV, I've had Hashimoto's, like, you know, it's just the flare ups obviously associated with it have, I've experienced my whole host of medical conditions that have been connected to mold, but now I'm kind of on the other side, but I have kids and I ended up having a leak. So I think regardless of whether, I I feel like mold is just something that everyone ends up experiencing at some point, whether they know or not. And it's just a really important topic when we discuss chronic health conditions and um, healing. So I'm really excited to get into the conversation and specifically like you've helped so many people. And I know you mentioned your second generation indoor environmental consultant. So your family has been in this space for a while. Um, But not every mold specialist is someone who's going to really move the needle. And I think that's the really important conversation to have because you can have like mold remediation that isn't effective. So I'm curious, how long has your family been in the mold industry um, industry, and how has your involvement in it, has it been like a different perspective than your family? Um, like tell us a little bit about how – you got into it. So I actually married into the family where this was the family business. Okay. Um, and so uh, my father-in-law, uh, his name is Mark Levy. I've mentioned him a lot on, on my podcast and everything too. It's, I feel like it's super important to kind of like pay homage to the people that helped you get where you are, you know? And so, yeah. um, so anyway, so uh, he's, he's my father-in-law. The family dynamic is so interesting. He has a twin brother whose name is Steve. His twin brother has a son whose name is Corey. Um, so Mark and his twin brother started their businesses about 20 years ago. And they were really the ones to kind of pave the way of looking at the way that we go through houses differently than like your local inspector does. And the big thing in their like origin story that's always stood out when we talked to them about it is you know, they would go into homes and people are sick and people ask questions, you know, like if, if I'm not feeling well and I have somebody coming in looking for something that I think is causing it, I'm going to ask questions about my health because it's hard enough to even find a doctor that knows how to do it. Right. So you're just trying to get information wherever you can. And they, they didn't have answers, obviously, to any of these questions. They're not doctors for one. And two, 
they didn't even know anything about it yet, right? They were just, they just started noticing this trend with everyone. So they, the two of them go to, I forget what conference it was because it was I, just from the story, but they go to one of these international medical conferences that fo- has a focus on, uh, on mold and how it impacts your health. And they're at this conference and it's a long time ago. So like these conferences have really blown up since then. Like you go to a conference like, I know ILAS, which is like a Lyme disease focused conference, but mold and Lyme are so well connected. And nowadays you go to these conferences, there's well over a thousand doctors just at this conference. I think about how many patients does each one of those doctors treat, right? Like how big the footprint is getting. Well, when they went to this one, there was like, I, I don't even know if there was a hundred people at this one that they went to. Like that's how long ago it was and sort of how it's grown just on the medical side, but they're there. And the doctors are like, are like, hey, what do you guys, uh, what do you guys practice? What do you do? You know, they're like, oh, we're not actually doctors. They're like, well, what are you doing here then? <laughs> and like, and so they explain what they do, right? And the and the conversation they've been having with clients, and immediately, like, all these doctors are like, oh my gosh, we really need you guys. And it really just opened their eyes to this, to this population of people that's so much in need and there wasn't really anybody that was able to help them on the environmental side of things the doctors are like clamoring for for people like you know like us to come around and help figure out what the exposure issues look like and that's really what opened their eyes up to to what was going on and they started kind of going you know changing the business that they did that was way more focused on really deep diving the health side of things understanding how the health is working for the individual, but then also redefining the way that we inspect homes and really looking at cutting edge research and technology to help us get the full understanding of what's happening in a space versus what like your general local inspector is going to do. Um, and, and that's really kind of how the family business sort of got started and how uh, it sort of transitioned into this very, very, um, you know, health specific type of process that we have now. And then fast forward a lot of years later, myself and Corey, who is my cousin um, through this whole process, uh, you know, we, we, we kept going to these conferences, but then we actually became speakers at the conferences, right? So now we're not just sitting there, but at these medical conferences, they're asking myself, they're asking Corey to actually come up and educate all the doctors on stuff. And as soon as we started doing that, we start getting referrals from every doctor across the country, right? But we were local companies, LA and one on the East Coast. At the time, we're like, well, we can't, we can't service Montana. Like, I, I don't know. What can we do? I don't know, right? Yeah. So Corey and myself basically took that upon ourselves to take sort of the the family business to the you know kind of a, you know expand it, go to the next level, however you want to say it. And we. We invested really heavily in technology and infrastructure. We created our own apps, our, our, our own platforms, our own everything, and basically created a company, which is WeInspect, that is fully able to now travel and still have the senior level consultants and myself and Corey and some of our other like senior members of our team be able to drive the entire inspection process while also flying one of our field inspectors to someone's house directly. So we're working with them in concert throughout the house. um, And we're able to expand kind of the knowledge base and the service we have now anywhere, basically. That's so incredible. Are you Orange County based personally? I am. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I saw that originally when I found out about you, I was like, no way this person is in Orange County because we're in Corona del Mar. Oh, no way. (laughs) Then I noticed that, yeah, it was a na- nationwide program and you, you guys did all that. And I was like, I just want Brian to come to my house. <laughs> like, that's all I want. I'm right here. But yeah, it was incredible. And and the fact that you guys have the, the DIY inspection program um, is amazing. But I, I think that I'd, I'd love for you to start by telling us a little bit about mold, um, who, listeners who might not be aware of it, and explaining the prevalence of it. You kind of got into that, obviously, because these doctors are trying to figure out how to heal their patients. But I know that mold can be found in nature as well. So how does the mold in nature differ than the mold in our homes? It's not really. It's just in your house as compared to outside. Right. Okay. The the idea is 
listen, mole's been around forever. The the people that are going to kind of like bad mouth this whole thing because they don't get it. The first thing they say is like, well, mole's been around forever and we're still alive, right? And like, I mean, yeah, kind of. There's a lot of things that have been around forever that we know now are not good for us. Like you, you can't just like, you can't just do that. I mean, asbestos for one, like not that it's been around forever, but it was something that was used. And now all of a sudden we're like, oh crap, this is really bad news, right? Uh cigarettes again we're like oh yeah was, in the 50s you could smoke in the delivery room when your wife was giving birth like how insane is that now you'd be arrested and like sent to guantanamo for doing that now yeah and like you just learn things and this is no different we've learned that yes it's a natural occurring thing but if it's within where you live and your exposure is so that you'll hear doctors say like dose and duration basically is what causes a lot of problems dose is how significant the exposure is like the concentration how many problems there are kind of what your what what your exposure is and duration is the length of time that you're being exposed to it if it's in your house you're exposed to it all the time so that's going to greatly increase the way that somebody is going to react to something like that right and so it's tough because certain people react and certain people don't and that's another thing that gets thrown out all the time typically what happens is that the the female in the house is usually the one showing symptoms there's reasons for this um and the and the male typically isn't um and so then it's you know the husband or the guy in the house is like you know this is crazy and then mold is normal whatever i don't feel anything meanwhile their wife or their girlfriend or whatever like their brain doesn't work and they have skin breakouts they have all these gi issues and all this stuff and like, there's a reason this stuff is happening. And just because it's not happening to one person doesn't mean it's not happening to another, you know? And the big things that really drive that, that I've learned, the three really big things is, is genetically, it's a large portion of us is literally 24% of the entire world population that's sensitized to mold. A lot of them don't know it, but they are. There's a genetic predisposition for that. Um, this is a lot based on the work from Dr. Richie Shoemaker, which is the guy that sort of put this whole connection together in the late 90s and early 2000s. So there's that piece of it. There's previous exposures. If you're exposed at a young age, it can literally rewire the way that your body responds to future exposures. And it can create autoimmune conditions. It can rework some of, you know, kind of the connections in your body and how it responds to stuff. So that's a piece of it. And then another piece is your current health condition. We all have an immune system. It all can handle, our immune system can handle so much, right? So if you're somebody who has Lyme or you have EBV or you have some sort of autoimmune condition or whatever's going on, your immune system is being taxed to a certain percent, right? Now you start adding additional things that your immune system has to deal with and it can overload it. And that's what can create a lot of problems. So there's a lot of variables in it. Um, but I guess the big thing to kind of say around that is, you know, just because one person's feeling something and another one isn't, doesn't mean it's not real. And just because there's this thing that is this natural thing, doesn't mean that it's necessarily okay to be around. Right. Like, yeah. like in the hunger yeah. games, there was poison berries, poison berries yeah. have been around forever. Don't eat the poison berries. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, also I feel like this kind of, goes into just like natural building materials as well. But there are certain materials in our homes that are just more likely, right? Like drywall, obviously, I'm assuming to mold or I don't know. I don't know that. But I, I personally feel like, you know, if we were using tile or I don't know what else could be like less likely to mold as quickly or grow, I guess. It, is that accurate? Or can you tell us about like American homes and how they're built. And I mean, you even hear about brand new homes. They just like didn't let them dry long enough. And then they're just like completely filled with mold. Yeah. It's really hard because if you had all the money in the world, you could build a house that had a lot a, you know, a much lesser likelihood of significant problems, but that isn't the normal person. Right. Yeah, exactly. So it's really hard to be like, well, do this and do this. Cause it's not like actionable stuff that anyone can do. Right. I always try to think like, what, what can I share with people? That is something that like most people can actually do, you know, that, that they have some sort of access or control or something like that. When it comes to our houses, we have very little control over that stuff unless you're just super independently wealthy and you get a plot of land somewhere and you get some private builder and you're really on top of everything. That's not most people. Right. So, the thing about houses 
is yeah, most of our houses are built, they're mold food. That's what it is, right? They're framed in wood. They're built with drywall. You know, this is all stuff that mold's going to eat, but mold doesn't grow just because the food source is there, right? It needs water to grow. Okay. So the thing that, that we have control over is water, is leaks, is maintenance of a building to make sure that you're preventing future leaks. It's like that stuff. If we could be on top of that stuff, it doesn't matter if your whole house is built in drywall. Mold's not going to grow on it if there's not a moisture issue. And I think that's more of the thing to focus on versus should I use a particular type of drywall or a specific this or that? Because at the end of the day, that the water, the moisture is really the, the big thing that we're trying to, to handle here. What about people in, like right here in Southern California living right by the beach? Let's say you have a house right by the beach. Are you able to prevent mold with just maintenance or is it just inevitable that it's going to grow? No, you know, it's funny. We do inspections all over the country, right? And then we do in the South, we do in places that are dry, like you know, Vegas and Arizona and stuff and kind of everywhere in between. The same types of problems show up everywhere. That's actually like the basis you mentioned in Mold Finder's Method, this program I created. The basis of it is every house you walk into, it's really the same thing. There's like little nuances. But there's walls, ceilings, floors, cabinets. It's all basically built out of the same stuff. They all have bathrooms. They all have kitchens. Like the, there's not these dramatic differences in homes, right? It's just understanding like how to go through certain rooms, what to look for, where to look for it, and kind of what that stuff looks like, right? But if I'm in Vegas or I'm in Mississippi, the problems that we find, 90% of them are the exact same thing. There, there definitely can be influence from where you live. Um, most times it actually manifests in the heating and air conditioning systems. If you're in a really humid place, a lot of times the HVAC systems will turn more into a source wow. because, and I don't know why they do this, but they'll, they'll create like a fresh air intake into your HVAC system. And basically what that means is that they'll actually pull air from the outside directly into your system. If you live in the South where your humidity is 80%, you're literally just flooding water into your system at that point. And there's no wonder that mold starts growing in it. So that's just a, a dumb design flaw, right? Like yeah. if, if you're being smart about where the moisture is, where it's coming from, if you live in a place with high humidity, you don't want a fresh air intake on your HVAC system, right? There's just some things to keep in mind. And if you do that, then those areas aren't really going to be significantly different than other areas. Wow. So, But HVAC systems are... Like that's even in your home, I guess. I just, I, I always think about it in like restaurants, hotels, big spaces, but so. Um, yeah, the H, the, it's your yeah, air conditioner. Yeah. It's your heater, it's your air conditioner, yeah. So when, when you say you go in, 90% of the issues are the same. It's typically, do you find that um, if it's left, at, like no one does anything about a situation, a mold situation in a home, does it get to a point where like you could probably smell it, you could probably see it, or um, is typically, or do you typically find things that are silent? Like what are you coming across? Yeah, so most times, no, that's a really good question, right? So like the smell piece, people describe as like a musty odor, you walk in somewhere, it smells musty. What the smell is, it's literally in, uh, the digestive gases of mold as it's eating. Um, <laughs> Friend of Dr. Jill Krista, a friend of mine, she she calls them mold farts, and that's actually what it is, right? <laughs> so when it eats, let's off gas. If you're smelling something, it's an active mold growing thing happening right then. That's what that means. Okay. Um, the the big problem is that's what people rely on a lot. We they there's two pieces. One, there's the smell. If there's no smell, there's no problem. That's the first thing. The second thing is if there's no water issue right now, so let's say there was a leak, I don't know, under, I don't know, kitchen sink or something, right? And and it got fixed, but then you didn't do anything in terms of like understanding if there was mold underneath the cabinetry or really testing or anything to that point, but you fixed the leak, right? So a lot of people will think, well, there's no more water, so mold can't be in a place where there's no more water. It's not true. Mold can't grow in a place where there's no water. But it could sure stay in a place after it grew when there's no water, right? Like, like think about a flower 
or a plant or something. You water a flower or a plant, plant grows. You take the water away. The plant doesn't just like pick up its bags like some traveling tribe and go find some river somewhere where there's more water. Like that's not what happens. The plant stays there. It just starts to dry out. It gets brittle. Like think about your grass. If your grass ever dried out, like you step on it, it almost like pokes you in the foot because it's so hard. And, and then like the blades of glass, grass will actually like break if you do that. That's what happens to mole colonies. So if there was a previous water leak that literally happened 10 or 15 years ago and mold grew as a result of that, it was never remediated. It was nothing was ever done about it, but we fixed the leak. So there's no problem. That mold is still there. And that is impacting the living space of your house. Those particles are breaking off of the colony and they're working into the house. And so what happens is that all of these things, they add up over time, right? And you end up with multiple hidden sources of problems that you can't see that are moving into the space. And I joke around about this a lot, but it's like totally true. I just say it as a joke. I don't know, just kind of the way I am, I guess. But like the, the secret to finding mold in your house is to not actually look for mold at all. Like the secret is to look for signs of water damage because we can't see mold. You can't see it. Most of the times it's behind a wall. It's under a cabinet. It's in the ceiling. Like you can't see it. And then even if it was somewhere on a surface, like labs need microscopes to see this stuff. So how arrogant are we to think that we could walk through a house with our eyes that are just normal eyes that I need glasses just for my eyes to work, right? And think that I can look at something and know that it's mold or not. If you have a mold inspector come in your house and they're like, oh, that's not mold or that's this or that, who the hell do they think they are, right? Like, like that's why labs exist. So you can't see this stuff. So, and a lot of times it gets dismissed as dirt or this or that if there is something visible. So the, the, the big secret to this whole thing is understanding what signs of water damage really look like and then being able to train your eye to go through your home and see those things. And that's really what Mole Finder's method is all about. And that's why so many people can use it and find all these problems in their house. It's not about like fancy tools and equipment and stuff. It's just understanding water makes mold grow. You can't visibly see mold typically, but this is what signs of water damage looks like. And if you could put those pieces together, you could literally go through and inspect your own house and find all the problems. As you may or may not know, we've been sharing the benefits of saffron with our community for a little while now. Growing up in a Persian family, I'd been aware of the benefits of saffron because of its prevalence in my mother's cooking. But as we began on the journey to create our own line of saffron-based products, I began to learn the powerful science behind the plant. Saffron has been used by many cultures for thousands of years, and now the research is backing it up, proving that just 30 milligrams of saffron per day is a natural source for enhanced emotional and physical well-being. At the fullest, we believe that incorporating ancient wisdom into our modern lives is one of the most powerful and accessible paths to healing. We also believe that everyone's journey is unique. So for our latest launch, we've created a line of saffron products in a variety of formats to help you curate saffron in your personal daily routine. Warm Feelings is our saffron latte powder and comes in individual sachets and in larger sustainable glass jars. Made with just certified high-grade saffron, organic coconut powder, and cardamom, it's the perfect coffee alternative and feel-good start to your day. If you prefer to pop a pill, Kinder Thoughts is our 30-day supply of saffron capsules and a super simple way to support your body and mood with the power of saffron. And if you're looking to strengthen your immune system, try our Mindful Immunity Syrup. This healing blend uses saffron to reduce inflammation, but also harnesses the power of an ancient Middle Eastern berry called barberries to fight infection, along with sea buckthorn and elderberries, all in a base of manuka honey to aid in antibacterial healing. It's a true immunity powerhouse. Honestly, at the moment, I'm using each of these products on a daily basis, depending on my needs. And to help you begin your own saffron journey, we're offering a discount of 15% off just for our podcast listeners with code the fullest podcast at checkout. I hope you enjoy your new daily saffron ritual. Wow. So typical signs would be like, um, like wood floors, not being like just kind of bubbly. Right. Would that be? Yeah, it? And, exactly. Uh, 
like drywall having yeah water stains but what else because i've seen like for me in particular i have a balcony right above my living room and like then all of a sudden like the door i guess wasn't keeping the water in from the rain and it was like leaking um and then i from the downstairs you could see it looked like there was like a tape coming off yes of, yeah, so that was I never I felt like I knew everything about and you know <laughs> all the mold stuff and then I didn't know that one and so sat there for like six months but before we figured it out. But yeah, what yeah. are other signs? So that's called peeling. That's one of the five signs. Okay. Um so cracking or peeling, they kind of fall together. So think if you like look at paint and paint is like chipping or cracking or cracking apart, like it doesn't do that for no reason, right? It's not always a hundred percent water. Like if you have, if you have, you know, the sun is beating on something like maybe that can happen. But the point is it's things like that don't happen for no reason. And those are like the clues that we use to check something out. So like if your paint's cracking or peeling, if there's bubbling, like in the baseboards or in your, or in the walls or in the cabinets, again, bubbling is like when water soaks into stuff, creates like this little bubbling effect, warping, you know, buckling and warping. You mentioned that like, so if a floor is like, you're walking and it kind of like bumps up a little bit, you know, like, why is that happening? Right. <laughs> like A lot of times that happens because water gets under there. It either swells up the subfloor or the wood floor on top and then it, it warps out a little bit. Right. Um, you know, visible staining is kind of obvious. So those are the types of things, you know, that you look to look for going throughout the house. And most times we go in a house, you know, we have moisture meters, you know, we have infrared cameras, all the fancy things you're supposed to have. Um, and we definitely use them. It's not like you don't use them. They can be helpful. But the truth is, is that honestly, probably 90% of what we find shows up absolutely nothing on either of those two, two tools, you know, because wow. the water's dry and it wouldn't be picking up on any of that stuff. But the visible damage is still there. And that's what we use to kind of drive the process. So at that point, do you guys differ in, in the way that you treat a mold situation than someone else? Because I feel like I mean, I, you know, I know that there are people who think you shouldn't use maybe bleach, but it's bad for the microbiome of it. I don't really know. I just, there's just so many different schools of thought. So I'm curious, what do you guys do and what do you think is the best way to go about treating it? Yeah. So the big thing when it comes to remediation is it's about source removal. It's not about surface cleaning. I think that's really the big thing to wrap our heads around. Like, think of it this way. If you have a mold problem, uh, say you have drywall and you see like a little spot of mold on the drywall, right? Let's just say you see a little dark spot on the drywall and people are like, oh, I'll just clean that off. It doesn't look that bad. What's behind the drywall, right? Like, you don't know what's back there. And most times that's where the biggest part of the problem is. And, you know, I use this analogy. It's, it's like an iceberg, right? Like the tip of the iceberg is not what sunk the Titanic. They got around that part. It was all the rest of it that they couldn't see. And that's exactly what happens in our house, right? It's not the little piece that you see. It's that there's this big, there's all this stuff behind the scenes that you can't see back there. And there's these little visual clues that show up at the front, you know? And that's really a deal. So if you're going in and we think, oh, we're just going to wipe something down, you're missing the boat in a lot of cases, right? I don't want to say every time, but a lot of times you're missing the boat. There's still going to be stuff that's left over there. Yet you'll then wipe away the visual cue. You'll think there's no problem there. You've given yourself this false sense of security. You now think there's nothing going on in your house. You're still not feeling a certain way that you're supposed to be feeling. Your doctor's running tests and saying, hey, there's something going on here. And you're like, well, there's nothing in my house because you wiped that spot off six months ago and it hasn't come back. And it probably hasn't come back because there's no more moisture that's allowing it to grow anymore. But that doesn't mean the rest of it isn't still back there, right? And that's a lot of times what the story is and kind of the, the path of what happens. So it won't grow if, when the moisture is gone. Like I always thought that it, um, that it just like grows. It can grow onto your furniture. Like I thought you needed to get rid of your furniture if mold had gotten on it. Is that true? Part, it really kind of depends on what it is. There's two ways that like contents and furniture and belongings get impacted. One is that mold physically grows on it. Again, mold is growing on it. It's pro probably what happened is you had a humidity issue. And let's say you were in a closet and some mold 
grew on clothes in a closet. The mold grew on the clothes in your closet because there's probably a mold issue in the closet walls or maybe the crawl space below the closet or something like that. That's probably why it happened. And, but because you're in a closet and there's not a lot of airflow, it kind of, you know, held up in there and created a, a, a elevated humidity issue in the closet and then mold starts growing on something, right? Same goes for like, if you have a furniture piece, it's like against a wall and you pull the furniture piece off the wall and the back of it has mold growing on it, there's probably a mold problem in your wall, right? And then it got trapped and then, and then the humidity peaks up and it starts growing there. So if you have visible growth on stuff, it's actually a lot to go into specific items. So I'll just kind of give generalities. I just finished a 16 page, I don't know, whatever you call it, like download guide, whatever, on how to like clean contents and what to do and not do and all that stuff. So it's kind of fresh in my mind. Um, but basically what I tell people is you have, if you have mold visibly growing on stuff, I would just be getting rid of that because everyone that I'm working with are pretty sensitive, right? So I'm not trying to mess around with, you know, this, I don't know, dresser that grandma gave me, you know, and I'm trying to keep it right. Like if that's the thing that's in your room, that's impacting what you're exposed to, like, just get rid of that one thing, you know? Um, and, and sort of, realize why we're going down this road right it's not about saving grandma's couch it's about getting healthy you know um but that's kind of the lesser way that things get impacted the the more common way things get impacted is cross-contamination what that means is you have a source of mold somewhere and spores come off of that colony and they kind of float around the house and those spores and fragments settle on items in the house they settle on the tops of your baseboards, they settle on different things, right? So if that happens, it's not that you have a physical growth problem, right? You basically just have a settlement problem. That's very different. So when you're thinking about that, there's a way that you can clean certain things depending on what it is. Um, and that's kind of where it would take too long. I'll probably cut it off there. But there are things that you can definitely clean and there's processes that you could do. And for some people, it's enough. And, you know, for some people, they're too sensitive even then, and maybe it doesn't work, but it's all kind of based on how solid the material is, or I should say how porous the material is. And the more porous it gets, the more difficult it is to clean. Okay, got it. I like that. And knowing, you know, why or how it got there, if it, yeah, if it was like spores landing on it or not. That happened to me in college, by the way, I rented a brand new apartment. I was so excited. I lived in Oregon. I came back to visit my family for the summer, had just moved all my clothes in there. And then I came back at the end of summer and my entire wardrobe and all of my furniture had mold on it. Every single item. That was when my dad was like, you actually might have to get rid of everything depending on what's going on. And so I, I got rid of like half of every half of my stuff and then dry cleaned the rest and hoped that that was helpful. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. It's tough to talk to people about their stuff. Right. And I totally yeah. get that. It's, it's so funny. Like you go through a house and I mean, let's say the house is, is so you find 20 things. Let's just say it's bad. Right. There's like a lot going on in the house. And then the conversation always seems to come back to like items and belongings versus the house. It's just because we have this connection with those things, I feel like, in more in, in a more, you know, just a different way. That's kind of why I always say it's like, I, obviously, there's a cost to replacing stuff. And I get that, right? So you kind of have to balance all that stuff out. That's, yeah. that's kind of why I created this guide that I'm going to get out here relatively soon to sort of help us think through the things that can potentially be cleaned right? Mm -hmm. Versus the things that you shouldn't be doing. And then maybe that helps like navigate the, well, maybe I'm not throwing everything away, but I'm throwing maybe certain things away and, and to kind of cut into what that overall cost of replacement of things is. But it's tough. It's a tough conversation to have. Yeah. So talking about just things being costly to replace and stuff, just removing mold in general can be costly. So what can people do that might not be able to afford professional help? I know you've created a whole system so that people can at least identify and inspect their homes on their own, which is already a really big deal because inspection can be expensive as well. But removing it, I mean, you you can get sick, right? From, if you're already sick and experiencing these symptoms, that's one thing. But then trying to go into remediating it on your own is also is very hazardous. So tell us a little bit about. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to remediation, you really shouldn't be doing it yourself. 
right? I mean, we're talking about we're talking about literally chemicals that are meant to kill living things that are being created yeah. by these molds. These chemicals are are literally used in biological warfare. They're developed and used in war to uh, to kill people. So, you know, we're talking biotoxins. We're talking you watch a movie and there's like a biohazard suit. Like that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. And it doesn't feel that way because it's in our house and we see this thing and, you know, whatever. You know, think of it the way that you would think of touching something with asbestos now. We know the connection of asbestos, you know, mesothelioma, these, you know, what happens. Like that's a more definitive connection that was created. The problem with mold is that the symptom set is across the board. It's multi-systems in your body. It can impact people differently, neurological issues, nervous system, GI, like there's all this stuff. And if you're exposed to this, it could really, really wreak havoc on you, right? But we look at it at our house and you see these DIY shows, you're like, oh, I could do this. Like, no, don't do this, right? Yeah. Get somebody in here that's putting up protective precautions. That's what, you know, have it done the right way. Because first off, if you do it yourself, you're probably going to miss stuff and you're probably not going to do it the right way in the first place because you've never done it before. You could have a process sitting in front of you. But if you've never, like for, like for me, I was just looking, I got this new app for like working out and it has like, um, like recipes in it and all this stuff, you know, it's actually pretty cool. And I'm like, oh, this recipe thing is really cool. It like makes your shopping list. It tells you how to actually prepare the food. That's pretty cool. And then I'm looking at the recipe thing. Like I don't cook. So I'm looking at this. I'm like, how do you, what is this? How do you do this? I've never done this before. Right. <laughs> And then, you know, my wife's like, oh, just chop this thing up or whatever. And then I do it. And she's like, what did you just do? That's not how you chop this thing up. Like, that's cooking. <laughs> like, like, like yeah. the stakes are very low on chopping an onion. The stakes are much higher <laughs> when you're ripping out walls that have toxins behind them. Right? Yeah. So, it's you know. so true. I've definitely had that conversation with my husband multiple times. <laughs> like, cutting <laughs> vegetables, he can like make a steak any day, but cutting vegetables, I'm like, I'll handle this. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So a lot of our listeners are renters and we've heard so many stories about people renting a place from their landlord and them getting sick and discovering mold. But then the landlord, the, and this is the true this is true for a lot of people i'm sure you've come across so many people a lot of people don't take it seriously and that's the other reason why some people think they can just hire you know anyone to just do it it's a handy man to come take care of it so what do you recommend renters who are seeing signs and either their landlord um doesn't care or i don't really know what the laws are around it but what yeah, yeah what is your advice to people Every place that I lived in in LA before I moved to Orange County, I moved out of because there was a mold problem that wasn't getting handled. Just wow. how it works. I rented, you know, all those places, right? That's just unfortunately how it works. So throughout the way, I've kind of figured out a framework to navigate all of it um, <laughs> and how to get in, how to get out of leases, how to like build. Also, I've, you know, I've, I've had clients that are they want to sue landlords and different things. And so we build sampling plans around how to collect the ammunition you need for a lawsuit and different things like that. Right. So there's, it really actually depends on your goal as a renter. Like, what are you trying to do? Right. Um, and I actually learned this, the whole reason I got into this field in the first place, you know, backtracking, it all started because I had a ceiling leak in my apartment from a pipe that was in there flooded down into my, it, you know, on my bed and into my bedroom. Wow. and created a huge problem um and i won't go into all the specifics i started not feeling well and uh my wife now i was dating her at the time her dad was mark who i mentioned before comes in finds all these problems that are going on now he does this after the landlord sends in their inspector who comes in spends 15 minutes takes an air sample in the middle of a room walks out and says everything is fine right the water had dried, by the way, backtrack to water not being a problem, right? The water had dried at that point from the leak, at least so they thought. He tested in one area, the water was, was dry. He said there was no problem. Lo and behold, later, Mark comes in and actually does a real mold assessment of the house, the, the way that I learned how to do it. Leak started in the ceiling, spread to the walls, 
because when water hits a horizontal surface, it goes sideways. I then went down the walls. Every wall in the room was soaked, but the ceiling was dry. So, but you couldn't see the water because it was wet behind, right? Yeah. Mold in all the walls. They were just a massive problem. So, but they had their guy that came in and said there was no problem. And so the landlord's like, there's nothing to do here, right? So, um, so Mark asked me, it's exactly what I just said. He's like, well, what, what's your goal here? What are you trying to do? Like, are you trying to stay in this place? Are you just wanting to get out of here? Like, what do you want? I was like, like, dude, this is like some West Hollywood dingy apartment. Like I'm ready. I, I don't need to be here. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so he's like, all right, so here's what we do. And so this was the very first renter framework that I learned. So I'll share this one. There's other ones, but I'll share this one. So it's like, okay, we're going to go, we're going to go through and document everything that we think is a problem in the whole place, not just your room, but everywhere. Right. Turned out there was issues in the kitchen and one of the bathrooms and things I didn't even know about. Right. Uh, that were outside of this leak issue that happened. Goes through, basically does the mold finders method inspection. This is where it was all, it was all created from me learning how to do this. Right. So it goes through the house does the whole thing, finds eight different things, I say house, in this little apartment that's not very big, finds eight different things that are going on. So like, okay, so if you're trying to get out of it, out of the lease, he's like, you'll need to sample every single one of these things. He's like, you need to sample a couple of them to prove that there's something here. And then you hold the rest of them, <laughs> hold the rest of them as leverage, basically. Um, like, okay. And so what you do is you sample a couple, you validate there's an issue. You provide it to the landlord, say, hey, listen, there's, these, there's two things that we tested. These are obviously problems you could see. These are problems. There's six other things in this place that I didn't test, right? So there's no proof that there's actually a problem here yet. They're not technically on the hook for anything yet, right? So listen, this could go one of two ways. I could go back and retest all of these things. And it could be on like the record for the place, basically. Or you could just let me out of my lease and we can just go our, our own ways and just be done with it. And that's what happened, right? So he helped me get out of the lease. Another time it didn't go so smooth. So I, cause I had this happen multiple times, I did the same thing, but then I had to get an attorney involved because the, the landlord just ghosted me right after yeah. a while. And so at that point I got an attorney involved, had them write me a letter. That's all that they did letter was basically threatening we're gonna you know we're not messing around here and bam out of that lease and i got moving expenses and whatever wow so here's the deal landlords don't want to deal with this right like like if they know there's a mold problem in there now they're like they're liable if they don't properly get things fixed and even if they're not doing properly they still have to call in like your serve pros of the world that don't do stuff very well but they still have to pay them right yeah and the whole way that these landlords make money is there's a spread between what they're paying in mortgage versus what they're paying in rent. And the spread is usually not very big. So if they have to come in and do a $5,000 remediation because you found some things in a place, they've probably just lost their profit margin for six, eight, ten 10 months on that unit for doing yeah. that. They don't want that. They'll just let you out. Somebody else will move in. And yeah. it sucks because somebody else will move into an issue, but we kind of have to, you, know, you can only do what you can do. Right. And so you, you kind of protect yourself with that way. So that's just kind of one way. To yeah. it. And the other way, I guess, would be when you're about to rent something and you kind of have a feeling there might be mold or you're curious, like, how do you, I mean, do you walk in and look like a freak with all these testing devices that you even mentioned probably don't work? Or do you just kind of do the same thing, but preemptively? Well, that's the beauty is you don't need all that stuff. That, yeah. that, if you're looking for a new place to go into, 100% get Mold Finders Method. If you're not, you're just asking for it because yeah. it literally tells you what to look for everywhere. And like when we were looking for the place that I'm in now, my wife and I had this like figure out because we were looking at a lot of places, you know, we kind of made this thing like, hey, uh, my wife's name is Nikki too. Um, yeah. Like, hey, hey, Nick, you, you go distract the person showing us the place. <laughs> and I'm going to pop into different rooms. I, all that I had was a little flashlight that fit in my pocket. Not even like one of those big flashlights, like one of those wow. little tactical flashlights. I would just go in, into a bathroom and do a different room. It would take me a minute. Look through the room real quick. All right, this room looks okay. Go to the next one. I would just do quick look-throughs of everything. 
And I would have her distract the other person, you know, the shower, because I don't want them to like, like, oh, these people seem like they're going to be high maintenance. Like, you don't want someone to think that about you. But that's how we did it. And I mean, I can't even tell you, we looked at 10 places before we found the spot. I just walk in. Nope, we're out. Nope, we're out. Nope, nope, nope. (laughs) And she would like take one into one room. I would go look in a bathroom, like in the other side of the apartment. And then she would come out of the room and I would just give her the look. And it's like, okay, time to go. And we would just wrap it up and get out of there. Um, But Mole Finder's Method teaches you exactly how to do that. <laughs> like, so you That's can amazing. look at all these places. It doesn't cost you anything for testing. It doesn't, you know, you're not paying an inspector to come out. You're not waiting for lab results. And you can have a pretty good take on whether or not you're getting into a spot with a significant problem or not. Yeah. Gosh, looking at 10 and finding one, I mean, I kind of feel like that's the norm. Like everything has mold and people just don't want to like fix it or deal with it or yeah, it's, it's wild, but it's so great that you created that system. And so I guess the next question and I, it'll be our last question. I know I've kept you for a while, but a lot the going back to just how it affects people. I mean, I have an employee who really wants to know this answer because obviously we know it affects people's well-being, your health, it can turn into autoimmune, it can turn into so many issues, the spores can get into your lungs, it can affect your pets and so many things, your children. But I, out of curiosity, like, is it, how does it affect yeast specifically, like on your skin topically? Like, can you give us kind of a rundown of um, issues that are typically seen that are connected to mold? Yeah. Just keep in mind, I'm not a doctor, everyone, so don't take what I'm saying as like gospel or anything. Yeah, this is not medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm also not a real doctor. Also, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not a doctor, not giving medical advice. Um, skin issues are common, um, a, a common side effect. Your the skin issues are basically an autoimmune response that happens. Um, I deal with skin issues, so been doing this for a long time. I have mycotoxins in my body. I have some stuff going on. And it's just because every house I went into for years and years and years had a lot of problems and I got exposed even though I was trying not to. And now I'm dealing with it, right? So personally, skin issues is one of the things for me. But the, this is, the phrase that's used a lot is multi-system, multi-symptom um, problem, right? And problem isn't the word, but whatever, illness or whatever they call it. Basically what it means is that mold can impact your body in so many different ways because of how it can get out and navigate and travel throughout your body. So one of the things I took away a lot from some of the conversations I had was talking about why the breathing pathway is the most bioavailable pathway for these things to impact you. And the reason that it is, if you think about it, you breathe in, obviously your lungs are what you're part of it, but you can breathe directly into your gut right? There's, that's a type of breathing that you do, right? Um, and so what you're exposed to in your environment actually directly impacts two major organ systems in your body. Now, from the lung piece, um, you know, your body, and actually, I guess, towards the gut too, but your body has this natural sort of filtration that's built in, right? Your nose, your throat, there's basically path passages in there that are meant to catch like bigger particles that are floating around so they don't get into your lungs. It's a way to try to protect your lungs. But a lot of the fragments that break off of mold colonies and mycotoxins and other things that are going in the house, they're smaller than those filters can pull out, right? So this stuff can get into our lungs. It could get directly into our gut. And these are both direct pathways to our bloodstream. So the lungs actually can penetrate out of lungs, get into our bloodstream. From the gut, it could work its way through the gut lining and actually damage the gut lining. It could change the microbiome in your gut, which could then result in bacterial overgrowths. It could result in like candida, which is like a a fungal overgrowth or yeast. I forget off the top of my head, but candida is another thing that happens. Um, So it could throw off that whole balance too. And there's so much more information now about the gut uh, immune system, like access, like how the gut is such a big, important part of the overall immune system because it houses all of this bacteria and stuff that is not supposed to get into the rest of our body, right? It's supposed to be there. It's not supposed to be anywhere else. But as soon as you throw off the balance of that stuff and maybe you're exposed to toxins or whatever's going on, it damages the gut lining and allows that stuff to escape out and get into the bloodstream. Once this stuff gets into our bloodstream, it creates immune response. It's like cytokines are basically created, which is this immune response, and that triggers a massive inflammation 
um, as a result of that. And then you get inflammation issues wherever it's being triggered, right? Now it's in the bloodstream. It's on the freeway throughout your body, right? So some people it's brain, right? Now you get, now you get, um, you know, there's this, this phrase called brain on fire where you look in under imaging and your entire brain is inflamed and wow. it looks like it's on fire. And uh, so a common symptom set is people will talk about how they have brain fog. Well, brain fog is basically your brain isn't working the way that it's supposed to be. And it actually can develop into what's called type three Alzheimer's. So you can actually develop like neurodegenerative um, issues from these types of things that are going on. That's wow. just one area, but skin, hormones, gut, and GI, like all these different systems in the body can be impacted by this stuff in different ways. So like Hashimoto's has a direct connection to mold exposure. I've seen bar has a direct connection to mold exposure, um, Lyme disease. And, you know, I'm sure the list goes on in different conditions. I don't know all of them, but yeah. My God, but that's why it's so important to remediate it. And that's why it's important to contact we inspect. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I've had, I, it's so crazy because going back, like I, every apartment I've lived in has had such, in, I've had so many like, different types of exposure to mold. And in each apartment, I had different things going on, right? Like I found out I had candida from the black mold in the bathroom in one of our apartments and um, Bend, Oregon, where it was just so moist there. And yeah, it's just crazy. And then now you know, I have a house and um, it's up to me to be the one, like, it's not like a lease I can get out of, right? It's the maintenance situation that you're talking about is just staying on top of it and being aware of what's going on and looking at the signs because you can't get out of, you know, things leak. Like there's constantly stuff going on and, and nothing's going to be perfect. So I think the answer is really going to be like just staying on top of it to make sure you're going to take care of it and contact the right people. And I, I'd love for you to share with us a little bit about how maybe your method might be different than other people's um, in terms of working with your company. Yeah, it's, it's very different, right? So go back to like my example of my apartment way back when, right? And so the guy brings in a local inspector. This is what all the local inspectors do. They come in, and they take air samples and they say, we're taking air quality tests, right? And if it's not in the air in the sample, then there's nothing going on. There's nothing yeah. happening, right? And you have to take um, the air sample like right next to exactly where it's happening, right? Well, this is the thing, but they don't do that, right? They, they say, we're going to come into your, you, you're going to call, you'll have people, they'll call, you'll call your local person and say, hey, I think that I'm concerned about mold, right? Don't even know anything else. I'm concerned about this. I want... I want a mold inspection done. They're like, okay, cool. So for, um, you know, uh, $650, we'll come out. We'll take two air samples in your house. We'll take one outside and you'll know if you have a mold problem. You might as well literally light that $650 on fire. Yeah. Like that's, that's what you're doing, right? But the problem is that that report or whatever the guy gives you, it's going to say you don't have a problem most times because those samples used in that way don't work very well. Do they and not so, business like what <laughs> well so this is the problem with the industry so when you say what's different between our process and and everyone else right in order to get certified i mean i did this when i got certified i took a test for two hours on a saturday bam i could go out and do mold inspections for anyone anywhere wow done right now granted i had a teacher that taught me how to do things the right way right nobody else has that right nobody has the the father-in-law or the dad or the cousin that that is already an expert in the field right that's not a thing that exists for everybody so um you know these people that go in they're like okay so this is a business all right cool and you could like maybe tie in with an insurance company or you could just like market on yelp and it's like okay so if i come out and the samples cost nowhere near what i'm charging for them that's where everybody makes their margins right so you, you upcharge on the samples so, okay, the samples cost this, so I can make this on every job. So that just means that I have to do X number of, of jobs a month, and that's the deal. And then it becomes a volume play for them, right? It's all about volume. How many can I do? I'm only doing a couple samples in each place because Lord knows I have no idea what to look for anyway. And then even if I did, right, even if you did get a sample that – and I know this feeling because when I first started, like – 
I was afraid of this too. I just had somebody to lean on. But I'm like, well, what if the sample says there's a problem? Like, how do I tell someone to fix it? Right? Because yeah. if I had a if I had a sample said, oh man, you got a problem here, you better believe your next question is like, okay, what do I do to fix this? Yeah. And luckily I, you know, I had someone that told me, right? But most people don't have that. And so a lot of times, like in the back of someone's mind, I could tell you this right now, I could go into a house and sample in a way that doesn't show problems if I wanted to. Or yeah. I could sample in a way that's actually pinpointing where it all is and finding it and then talking about how to fix it. I could go in the same house and I could get two completely different reports if I really wanted to. And that's the big difference, right? And the problem is all the local inspectors that are around, that's kind of how they do it. They come in, they take an air sample in the middle of the space. The reason they don't work is because the farther away from the source that you get with an air sample, the air sample becomes exponentially less accurate. And I knew this for a long time. And then so for a year on every inspection that we do, we inspect, I did in a house, uh, I would one area where like I thought, let's say I thought there was mold behind a wall or something, right? And I felt pretty confident it was going to come back with an issue. I would then have a sample. I would also take a sample like three or four feet away from that wall at like, you know, quote breathing level, which is where somebody would take an air sample in a room. Yeah. And I wanted to show how, how different that is right? And 80% of the time, the sample I took three or four feet away said there was no problem when there actually was a problem in the wall. Wow. So that's the difference. It's just the difference of finding, of, of prioritizing source and how to find it and how to look for it. And then also what the remediation plans look like. That's a whole other thing we didn't get, get into, but the way that we write up the plans for remediation is different as well in order to address the actual source problem, what's going on. Okay, yeah. So people who inspect typically don't sub help remediate, right? So they'll probably write a remediation plan, okay. right? Uh, but they don't typically do the remediating themselves, right? So another company will come in and execute their plan. So it's really about what is the quality of their plan, right? And okay. if you take, let's just play this out. Let's say I took an air sample in the middle of a room. Let's say Stachybotrys, black toxic mold was in the air sample. Let's just say. I took that sample literally in the middle of a room. Where the hell is it coming from? Yeah. I guess we just have to gut this entire room because I have no idea. <laughs> like like yeah. versus, oh, there's a window over here. It's coming. The window's leaking. It's in the wall under the window. We could take out the wall below the window a couple feet out and then you got it. Yeah. Right. Like that. Yeah. But how do you know it didn't spread? Like, I think that's my, I, like I mentioned, my balcony the door was leaking on top and then it got down and then it was right above my fireplace in the living room that we ended up, we ended up doing the ceiling, I guess, opening up this full ceiling, but mm -hmm. I wasn't convinced that it was all gone. So I'm just curious, like, how do you know how much of the ceiling to take out, you know? So that's part of the difference in how like the protocols are written, right? Yeah. So like when I'm training, when I'm training my team, and even in literally even in Mulfine, I keep referencing it, but like everything I train my team with is in that program. That's why I keep referencing it. But there's a module in there that talks about basically the idea of that you need to be looking at the next adjacent area that could have been impacted. Because water moves. It doesn't just stay in one spot, right? Um, so like for you, you had an issue, I'll just like walk through this in my head. So you had like this patio door up on the second floor, leak from the door, gets into the ceiling. It's near the wall because there's an exterior wall where the door was, right? So it gets into the ceiling and then you have a fireplace on that wall too. So what I would have been doing for testing, just without even seeing anything, is I would have been testing the walls on both, uh, or depending on how much of the leak happened on the door, but, but the walls on the second floor level by the door to make sure that those walls weren't impacted. Right. Yeah. And then I would have tested the ceiling down below, right, where we think that it impacted. But then the next thing I would have done is I would have tested the wall running down where the fireplace is to make sure that the water didn't continue down that path and that there was something else that was going on. Yeah. So part of the, the, the thing is building out a sampling plan that can help you understand the extent of remediation that's needed. Right. And that's a big thing that happens is that the remediators or the inspectors or whatever will come in. They'll say, you only have to remove this two feet. 
the guys, it, it, it doesn't work that way. Like it moves, right? You have to know how far it moved to really know if you're getting it, right? And so that's just kind of a, an example of like how I would map that out. Okay, that makes sense. So if someone has an issue, they can contact We Inspect, and then you guys help them figure out like the testing and then also come up with a re remediation plan. And then do you guys also remediate or you find someone who will do what you think they should do? No. So we, yeah, we identify where the problems are. We then test in a different manner to understand how they spread through the house, which kind of talks about your items and belongings, like we were talking about before, yeah. sort of feeling for that. We'll, uh, we'll open and look at the air conditioning systems too, because that circulates all the air around. So you can't have a problem in there. And then we write the remediation plan of what needs to be done to fix everything. Not only like the individual area, like this wall or this cabinet or whatever, but also like a 10,000 foot view back of what order do you do all this stuff in so you don't screw up the thing that you just did, right? Yeah. So yeah. Like, we'll do that too. That comes as part of the plan. And then that plan would then go to a remediator and then the remediator would execute our plan. And then, yeah, we, we refer, uh, we can refer remediator as well for, for our clients too. Oh my gosh, that's so amazing. Thank you so much, Brian, for joining us today. You are a wealth of knowledge and I can't wait to have you back on to talk just remediation. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you for having me. This is really fun. Yeah, it was so great. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.